Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. I'm Jason Miller. Tonight on the Evan Miller Report, a Dutch a Chechen woman, a woman uh, kidnaps her Dutch children to join Islamic State. We have the latest. Iraqi intelligence reveals the Baghdad car bombers tricks. In Afghanistan, the army kills a commander of an Islamic State affiliate. Over in the Ukraine, they unveil a draft bill that would, that, that would determine the rebels' autonomy. In France, the second of two French warships uh, whose delivery to Russia has been suspended due to violence starts its sea trials tonight. And we prep you for the Israeli Prime Minister's elections on the program tonight. Plus... Corey Thank you, Jay. Two dozen are dead and 3,000 are now homeless after a cyclone in Vanuatu. I can see why Jay doesn't like McDonald's. In our business report, McDonald's Mc- employees are getting McBurnt on the McJob while, cooking out, while cleaning out the McCookers. A blood mistransfusion too many has resulted in a red-stained edition of Lawsuits Across America. And Toto is now missing more than just the rains down in Africa today. That's all coming up in this edition of your conservative news source. The Evan Miller Report starts now. Live from Southern California, this is the Evan Miller Report. Jason Miller with news and politics. Corey Evan with business and entertainment. This is the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media. Here now. And, and a very good evening on this Monday, March the 16th. Hope you had a cool weekend uh, here, uh, uh, this weekend here, at least on the West Coast. We were looking at summertime temperatures over here in Southern California. And Corey, we can't say it enough, we really pay for our sunshine out here in Southern California. Absolutely. Just like parking in L.A., I got a carpool down to L.A. for my Hollywood trip this weekend, but I can understand why a lot of folks don't want to live in L.A. these days, because you even pay $15 just for parking for our Hollywood tour. Well, you know what's more asinine than L.A. parking? Watching Michelle Obama dance on The Ellen Show. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. And I also saw the clip of President Obama reading mean tweets over on Jimmy Kimmel. Mm. My, my, my. So, folks, you have a choice here, at least for folks here in the state of California. You either stay home, watch Michelle Obama dancing her tootie off, or you pay $15 for parking and go get some fresh air. What's the choice? Mm. We'll starting to look decide. like, yeah, starting to look like it's more worth the money now. Mm-hmm. So we'll invest, invest in an ACE parking structure today. By the way, good idea. Not support ACE parking on this program. That was just used as a joke, ladies and gentlemen. So for those of you up in the network brass who think we got an advertising deal with ACE parking, that's further from the truth. Not gonna happen. All right, folks, the humor is out of the way. The Monday humor man is leaving the building because it's time to get to the news now here on the Evan Miller Report. And we start off in Chechnya tonight where a woman living there in in the Netherlands from Chechnya has taken her two young children against their father's will to join the Islamic State group in Syria in what is believed to be the first such case, prosecutors said today. The unnamed 32-year-old refugee flew with her children, a boy aged 8 and a girl aged 7, from Charleville in Belgium to Athens in November, possibly using false passports after their Dutch father warned police of their imminent departure. She is most likely in Syria now. We are probing a kidnapping case, said a public prosecution spokeswoman, Elizabeth Kober, and she was speaking to AFP. The Chechnya woman and her children, who are Dutch nationals, were photographed as she withdrew cash from a cash machine located in Istanbul in mid-December. 
the Dutch Limburg newspaper report on Monday. On, back on December 28th of last year, she posted a picture on Facebook believed to have been taken in the Turkish-Syrian border town of Tel Aviv, which is controlled by the Islamic State group. In early January, she phoned her mother in southern Dutch city Mastro and told her that she was in the ISIS stronghold of Raqqa, after which nothing further had been heard. The mother has taken the children against the wishes of her ex-husband, who has custody, said public the prosecution service spokesperson Bart de Harten. Unfortunately, there's very little we can do if they are in Syria, he told state broadcaster NOS. At least 160 people have traveled from the Netherlands to join jihadist fighters in Syria and Iraq, said Dutch Interior Minister Ronald Postark late last year. Nine of these were living from Lungsburg province, including six from Mass Great, according to news reports. And stay with the Evan Miller Report. We'll keep you up to date on this developing story. Over to Iraq now, where trap doors and floorboards and liquor bottles on back seats. This is according to Iraqi's intelligence service on Monday, and how they detailed how Islamic State groups car bomb cell included the po eluded the police for months. The suspected leader of the group was arrested riding a bicycle in an upmarket neighborhood, according to a spokesperson when he talked to the AFP news agency at the intelligence headquarters in Baghdad. The Iraqi National Intelligence Service, also known as INIS, announced on Sunday it had arrested up to 31 people responsible for planning and carrying out 52 attacks in Baghdad in 2014 and 2015. When we first picked up a scent in our hunt for this network, we organized surveillance that lasted six months, said spokesman Fethil El Ashri when he spoke to AFP. Then we set up a task force and arrested all of them within 72 hours. We arrested the leader as he was riding his bicycle in Manistore. Intelligence officials have released footage of the 31 suspects. 31 suspects lined up in brown jumpsuits at a detention facility with their bomb-making equipment and weapons in front of them. The intelligence service would not provide any names, and a senior official would not give his name, said investigators were still looking for 10 cell members. The reason for the decrease in attacks in Baghdad over the past three weeks is the arrest of this network, said Philim el when he spoke to AFP. And stay with the Evan Miller Report. We'll keep you up to date on that developing story as well. All right, over to Afghanistan, where the Afghan army has killed a militant commander who has claimed allegiance to uh, the Islamic State, or Daesh, as we like to call them. The Ministry of Defense said on Monday, in an operation in the southern Helmand province, long hotbed of the insurgents' activity, Hakvis Wakne and nine of his men were killed. The ministry said in a statement, Waqid is the second militant commander who claimed links to the extremist ISIS group to be killed in Helmand. His uncle, Abul Rahif Kadmin, was killed in a drone strike back in February. Kadim was a former Taliban commander who had switched allegiance and allowed his fellow followers with the Danish group, which controls about a third of Iraq and Syria, in a self-declared cultate. He has allegedly set up a Danish recruiting network across southern Afghanistan. And ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is, uh, it's almost time, more, less than 24 hours away until the Israeli elections uh, that supposed to happen here, uh, happen over in Israel. And at, to prep you for what is going on in Israel and get an update on the campaign of Benjamin Netanyahu and the opposition Zionist party. We're going to go over to the BBC's Lise Doucette, and she has an update on what is going on 24 hours before the elections. By ordering a judge. ...campaign in a country which is known for its extremely tight election races, but even by this standard, you can feel the panic rising at this 11th hour, only hours to go before nearly 6 million Israelis eligible to vote turn out to cast their ballot. When Benjamin Netanyahu declared an early election last December because of an unworkable coalition, he thought at the time it would be an easy race. But the last polls that are allowed before election day showed that his main challenger, the center-left coalition, headed by uh, Yitzhak Herzog, could possibly be a few seats ahead. 
So in these final hours, both sides are making new promises to the voters. But whoever wins in this poll will still have to put together some kind of a coalition. It's not just the king that matters, but the king maker. We're going to speak uh, to members from the two main coalitions in just a moment. But first, we have this report from our Middle East correspondent, Kevin Connolly. It's been a long campaign, but Israel's opposition parties are starting to believe they can win this election. They're the ones in step with the voters, they say, on key issues like education and the cost of housing. In the crush of a hectic campaign event, the opposition leader, Itzhak Herzog, sounded confident. It's a referendum on many issues that bother the Israeli public. We are a very vibrant democracy. People tend to forget that. But yes, it's a referendum whether we will continue having Netanyahu or change. Winning means beating this man. Benjamin Netanyahu is a veteran of the campaign trail. These pictures filmed not by journalists but by his own Likud party are meant to show he cares about cost of living issues, an area where the opposition feel that he is weak. To the makers of this satirical TV show, Wonderful Country, Mr. Netanyahu's a slick showman with a tendency to take the voters for granted. <laughs> In election debates, the Prime Minister's allies defend him as a statesman, a leader to be trusted with the country's security in uncertain times across the Middle East. Netanyahu is highly appreciated as extremely capable, experienced and competent leaders. And opinion polls show that if you ask who uh, uh, can fit as Prime Minister of Israel, who is more capable, Netanyahu is leading by enormous margin. So the left has the energy to get its people out. But ultimately, that's not how you win here. Victory goes to the big party that can get smaller parties into coalition after the voting. Benjamin Netanyahu thinks he still has the advantage there. We will soon find out. Kevin Connolly, BBC News, Tel Aviv. So all the ingredients for an interesting election, a very tight race and extremely important issues. It's always that way in Israel. And as always, there's a range of domestic issues, this time a rising cost of living and housing shortages and, of course, uh, security problems and whether or not to make peace with the Palestinians. I've been out in one of the main markets of Jerusalem, the Mahani Yehuda market, to test the mood of the voters. It's only two years since the last election in Israel and in this highly politicized society they're going to the polls again in an early election and the issues are still the same the rising cost of living trying to make peace or not with the Palestinians of course it's about personalities and the dizzying array of political parties but what are Israelis make of this early election let's let's talk to a few hello Shalom Hello. Tell us, are you, what for you is the main issue in this election? Uh, basically the, the cost of living, which is very expensive in Israel. Um, the, the apartments and everything is very, it's hard to, to reach and, uh, you know, end the month, as you say. And uh, also we would like to see a government that is uh, going towards peace and uh, we would like to basically the left wing to, to take over. So you don't want Benjamin Netanyahu to continue? No. No? no? You don't? No. After six uh, long and uh, hard years, I think that it's... Uh, we had enough. Why do you still support Benjamin Netanyahu? I'm always, all my, uh, all my family. You know, everything uh, is very important, the economic, but for me, the security is the, is the best important. So you think Benjamin Netanyahu can bring you better security, bring yes. Israel security? Always. Always the right. And that's how it sounds here after decades of failed business. Six years of Benjamin Netanyahu, and here in this market, they're still shouting BBBB by his nickname. There's a lot to play for in these elections, and we'll soon find out what Israelis decide when they go to the polls. And that was the BBC's Lise Doucette 
reporting on the elect prime minister's elections over in Israel. That is supposed to happen tomorrow. Stay with the Evan Miller Report for the latest on the prime minister's elections and we'll be carrying the BBC's live coverage of those Israeli elections tomorrow and have live updates throughout the night right here on the SHR Media Network. Stay tuned for that. All right, over to Ukraine where they uh, voted uh, uh, vote will vote this week on bills granting separatist areas in the east special status in line with a February peace deal as one soldier died in continuing sporadic clashes. The bill submitted by President Petro Poroshenko to Parliament at the weekend and whose text became available Monday fall in line with the commitments by Kiev in the ceasefire deal inked last month. The rebels in the east have threatened to resume fighting unless Kiev follows through on the promises given in Minsk to grant rebel areas greater autonomy, although keeping them within the Ukraine. The bills state that rebel-controlled areas in Donetsk and Lunatesk regions in the east will attain their special status, giving preference to Russian language and possibly increased cooperation with Russia only after holding elections in accordance with Ukrainian law and under international observation. All armed groups and weapons would also have to disarm or leave Ukraine, and Ukrainian media must be allowed to operate in the region, according to the text of the bill. And over in Russia, meantime, more than 45,000 Russian troops as well as warplanes and submarines started military exercises across much of the country on Monday. In one of the Kremlin's biggest shows of force since its ties with the West plunged to Cold War lows, President Vladimir Putin called the Navy's northern fleet to full combat readiness in exercises in Russia's Arctic North, apparently aimed at dwarfing military drills in neighboring Norway, a NATO member. New challenges and threats to military security require the armed forces to further boost their military capabilities. Special attention must be paid to newly created strategic formations in the north, said Defense Minister Serge Shorkov, quoted by the RIA news agency. Shorkov said the order came from Poon directly, was promised to spend more than 21 trillion rubles, that's about 340 U.S. 340 billion U.S. dollars by the end of the decade to overhaul Russians' fighting forces. Putin made his first public appearance since March the 5th on Monday, an absence from view that had fueled feverish speculation over his health as well as his grip on power. In this newsman's opinion, this guy is full of theater and third theater and always loves to put on a good show. More than President Obama, I, I must say. But back to the story. Norway is currently holding its joint Viking drills involving 5,000 troops in Finnwark country, which borders Russia in the resource-rich Arctic Circle, where both countries are vying for influence. Russia's drills would include 40,000 servicemen, 41 warships, 15 submarines, according to RIA News Service. And to wrap up, wrap up our uh, Russia news, the second of two French minstrel warships whose delivery to Russia has been suspended due to violence in East Ukraine began its first open sea outing today, uh, according to AFP journalists who were observed the start of those sea trials. The sea Bastopol was eased from its St. Nazir port in western France by tugboats just after 1 p.m. local time for a scheduled five-day test voyage without Russian Navy personnel on board. The nearly completed projection and command warship is theoretically slated for delivery to Russia in the autumn of 2015 after undergoing a barrage of technical verification tests at sea. But unlike the Vostok Mistral class ship commissioned by Moscow under the same 2011 contract, valued at about 1.2 billion euros or 1.3 billion U.S. dollars, the Special Bull will be retained by the country of France under Western sanctions against Russia for its support of separatist rebels in eastern Ukraine. Testing scheduled during the Sepulchre's maiden outing was not revealed by authorities or the ship's STX builders. All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and send it over to my colleague, Corey Evan. He has more on a Pacific cyclone that has wipe, uh, wiped out a 16-island nation. He has more on that and a wrap of our international news headlines. Corey? 
Thank you, as always, Jay. The UN in Vanuatu says 24 people have died and 3,300 are displaced after Cyclone Pam hit the Pacific Arp Archipelago early on Saturday. The UN Disaster Assessment and Coordination Team in the capital, Port Vila, said 37 evacuation centers had been set up, but communication with outer islands was still down. President Baldwin Lonsdale said the storm had wiped out all development of recent years. He called again for international aid. Of those who died, 11 were from Tafia Island, 8 from the main island, Efeit, and 5 from Tana. The evacuation centers were catering for the many people who had lost their homes, the UN said, adding that the response effort was for now focusing on the capital and Efeit. After aerial assessments of the damage caused by the storm, Shefa remained the only province declared an emergency, the UN said. Aid began arriving in the storm-hit nation, one of the world's poorest, that is, after flights to Port Villa resumed. Tropical Cyclone Pam is slowly weakening as it travels toward New Zealand and poses no further threat to Vanuatu or the South Pacific. That, according to a UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs report. One village chief there said there was a desperate need for fresh water supplies. Moving on to one out of London, Britain's independent police watchdog says it is looking into allegations that Scotland Yard Cup covered up historic allegations of child abuse from the 1970s to the 2000s. This from the Miami Herald. The Independent Police Complaints Commission said Monday it is investigating 14 referrals, including claims that the force suppressed evidence and hindered or halted investigations because police officers were involved. Sarah Green, deputy chair of the commission, described the allegations as being of the most serious nature. Scotland Yard is also investigating the allegations. Among the allegations are claims that a House of Parliament document found at a child sex offender's address linked lawmakers and police officers to a pedophile ring. The police said in a statement that recent convictions showed that the service is committing to investigating non-recent allegations of sexual abuse, the latter being in quotation marks. In a story on March 14th about a military helicopter crash off Florida that killed 11 people, the AP previously reported that when the Black Hawk crashed, it was on two, uh, excuse me, it crashed. Yes, I am doing national news now. Sorry to, yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> right. It turned out that they previously reported that it was early Tuesday that the Hawk crashed, but it is late Tuesday, just to bring you up to snuff. The large sections of a Black Hawk helicopter that crashed during a nighttime training mission were pulled Saturday from the waters off Florida's panhandle amid efforts to recover the remains of all seven Marines and four soldiers who were killed. The salvage operations that had been interrupted Friday night by bad weather were expected to finish late Saturday, said Eagle Air Force Base spokesman Andy Borland. The debris pulled from about 25 feet of water in the Santa Rosa Sound off Navarre will be moved to the Air Force's Hurlburt Field to be examined by investigators. The probe into the crash is being led by the U.S. Army Combat Readiness Center based in Fort Rucker, Alabama. Investigators are already on site, according to Mr. Borland. And an L.A. police officer is reportedly a suspect of human trafficking after a person was discovered hiding in the officer's car. A second LAPD officer is being sought in relation to a shooting death in Pomona, California. Oh, thank you for letting me know about this one, Fox News. Uh, Customs and Border Protection. Yeah, I know. My birthplace. Yeah, this one actually hits home for me. Anyway, a Customs and Border Protection spokeswoman told Fox 5 San Diego that a 34-year-old man, along with a 31-year-old woman in the passenger seat, were referred to an investigated, an intensive, excuse me, inspection area after they handed over their passports at the Otay Mess post of entry on Saturday evening. She said CBP officers discovered a 26-year-old Mexican head hidden in the truck of a white 2014 Nissan Juke while doing an X-ray of the vehicle. KNX 1070 News Radio is reported the officer was placed under the arrest on Sunday and is being questioned. The woman has also been placed under the arrest. The officer reportedly works out of the Hollywood division. Meanwhile, LAPD officer Henry Solis is being sought in relation to a fatal shooting of Salome Rodriguez of Ontario. Rodriguez, a truck driver, died after being shot in the lower torso. Pomona police have issued a poster calling Solis a person of interest in the shooting, which occurred in a downtown bar district after the two men got in a fight. A VW Jetta belonging to Solis, a rookie assigned to a station in the San Fernando Valley, was found a short distance from the site where Rodriguez was gun gunned down early Friday in Pomona. Police in the suburb east of L.A. 
police said in a statement. Solis was off duty at the time of the shooting and failed to report to work the next day. Interesting stuff happening in Pomona. And while I collect my thoughts on this, I will go ahead and send it to break. When we come back, the stocks are bouncing back. Workers bouncing back words as they get McBurnt on the McJog. The Teamsters in Des Moines, Iowa spent tons of cash at the pubs and are now being sued in lawsuits across America. Toto Spaces has succumbed to ALS in entertainment. And Jay, I have an update on how Americans feel about the NSA cleanup. And I hear you've got something about China. What do you got? Well, Corey, we'll tell uh, tell you how China has overtaken other countries as the world's third biggest arms exporter when we come back on the program. Also, Greece debt talks are too slow. This coming from the EC chief. Junker, we have more on that. In DC News, the White House is consulting former military general Petraeus on the fight against Danish. And federal agencies have made $125 billion in improper payments on what, you might ask? Might be that bad coffee we're drinking here in the studio. We'll tell you that when we come back here on the Evan Miller Report. But as we go to break here on the Evan Miller Report, here's a look at the international weather forecast now with Sarah Keith Lucas of BBC World News. East of New Zealand, but it still will bring some gusty winds and heavy rain lingering for a time for the North Island on Tuesday. We've also got Cyclone Nathan off the coast of Queensland that may bring some breezy wet conditions later in the week. Meanwhile, a dry story for the Philippines for the next couple of days, but a tropical storm out towards the east will head across the islands during the latter part of the week. Still some very mild air in charge across northern parts of India, so we could well see further snow melt, increasing those river levels in the mountains to the north of India. Some gusty winds likely to bring further dust storms across parts of Mali, Chad and Mauritania too. Some heavy rain across coastal parts of Tanzania. And we've got low pressure in the Mediterranean bringing heavy showers to places including Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily and Italy too. Meanwhile, heavy rain continues on Tuesday across northern parts of Mexico. Heavy showers and thunderstorms too likely for parts of Colombia, Ecuador and the west of Brazil. That's it for now. Bye-bye. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. Is radio? Hark, 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 do. Hark, 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 do. Radio? Hark, 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 do. Hark, 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 do. Radio? Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. How you doing? John Grant here. When I'm not slaving over a hot microphone on the 405radio.com Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, I check out Sean and Clint here at Sackheads Radio. We all appreciate the best political bloggers, writers, and commentators. We either get them on our shows or we make fun of them, as it should be. So check us out live Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern or forever on the podcasts on the 405radio.com. This is Tammy Jackson, inviting you to join me on The Tammy Jackson Show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific on 405radio.com. Put down that remote and tune into the show that covers politics, guns in the Second Amendment, religious liberty, sanctity of life, the military, and more. I host newsworthy guests and work hard to be a conservative radio show that's not like all the others. So stay Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific for me, Tammy Jackson, on the 405media.com. Hello, I'm Paul, a student at Hillsdale College. Here is my professor, Dr. Larry Arn, on the separation of church and state. America's founders believed in the separation of church and state, in that the country was not to have an official religion or an official sect. But that did not mean that government was to be hostile to religion or even indifferent to religion, as many today argue. In fact, America's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, includes both a reference to God as the author of the laws of nature and a confident assertion that human beings are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Far from being hostile or indifferent to religion, America's founders understood the theology of the Declaration to be an essential part of the education of citizens. 
This Constitution Minute was brought to you by Hillsdale College. To join the national conversation on the Constitution, go to constitutionminute.org. Hi, this is Rooster from Outcry Radio. Catch me here on Blog Talk Radio every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or follow my blog. Now back to the Sackheads. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. Radio. And welcome back to the Evan Miller Report here on the SHR Media Network. I'm Jason Miller. Corey Evan back in just a couple moments with some of the day's other headlines, plus the business report tonight. First, though, China has overtaken Germany to become the world's uh, world's third biggest arms exporter, although its 5% share remains small compared to the combined 58% of exports from the U.S. and Russia, according to a new study. China's share of the global arms market rose 143% from 2010 to, to, uh, 2010 to the year 2014, a period during which the total volume of global arms transfers rose by about 16% over the previous five years, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute said in a report released today. Its share of the world market was up from 3% in the 2009 to 2014 period when China was ranked ninth among exporters of warplanes, ships, sidearms, and other weaponry, said the institute known as SIPRI. The data showing the growth strength of China's domestic arms industry now producing fourth generation fighter jets, navy freights, and a wide range of relatively cheap, simple, and reliable smaller weapons used in conflicts around the globe. Responding to the study, the Chinese Foreign Ministry and said China took a cautious approach to arms exports invited by the relevant UN resolutions and domestic laws. They continued to BS and say, quote, We follow the principle that the export of arms will help increase the recipient country's legitimate self-defense capabilities, not undermine international or regional peace and stability. We don't intervene in their domestic affairs. So they say, ladies and gentlemen, but you be the judge on that report. Moving on to business, international business news, that is, European Commission President John Clark Juncker has criticized the slow pace of progress in talks over Greece's debt since last month's interim deal. At a meeting with Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras in Brussels, Mr. Juncker said he was not satisfied. Mr. Tsipras needs EU support for reforms to unlock vital funds and to avoid a possible bankruptcy and a Eurozone exit, which we would love to see here at the Evan Miller Report. But let's continue on with the story. The communist leader has pledged to end austerity, but his plans have met resistance from Greece's EU creditors. Greece negotiated a four-month extension to its bailout last month after tense talks with creditors. Eurozone leaders are ready to extend help on Greece's 240 Euro, uh, billion euro, uh, 240 billion euro, or 272 U.S. billion dollar bailout until the end of June. To persuade the EU of its credit worthiness, Greece has announced a series of reforms, but it also wants the EU to agree new terms for the long-term repayment of its debts. If no agreement is reached, Greece risks being unable to meet its obligations within the next two weeks alone. It needs 6 billion euro, uh, euros to pay its creditors. Mr. Junker said he was not satisfied with the developments. In an earlier meeting with the President of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, uh, Mr. Tapers urged the EU to back growth in Greece. Now is the time to give hope to the Greek people, not only implement, 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 and obligations, ob obligations, obligations, said Mr. Tuspers. Doesn't he get a monotonous yet repetitive, Mr. Corey Evan? A bit, it sounds like. S sounds, like sounds like a sloppy squirrel uh, cartoon put on repeat to me. Anyway, back yes. to the story. Analysis have described last month's interim bailout agreement as a climb down for the Greek government which rose to power on promises to ha ha have half of the country's debt rewritten off. Mr. Tysperia has defended the deal. 
It will need to flush out its reform program in detail by April and prove that reforms are betting down before receiving a final bailout disbursement of 7.2 billion euros. And Corey Evans got the U.S. based business news now. Corey, how's the U.S. stock markets taking that great news today? Much better than last week. The Dow is up 228 points at 17.977. The Nasdaq up 57 at 49.29. And the S&P up 27 at 28.81. It's a bit of a roller coaster. U.S. stocks bounce back after losing ground for three weeks as the dollar's rally against the euro abated. Elsewhere in financial markets, oil closed at a six-year low below $44 a barrel as supplies continue to outplay outpaced demand. Treasuries gained after some mixed reports on the economy. The stock market has stumbled in recent weeks as the dollar has surged against the euro. The currency has been rising on expectations that the Fed will start to raise interest rates even as the ECB continue to provide stimulus to that region's economy. A stronger dollar is a problem for big U.S. companies that rely on overseas sales because it makes their goods more expensive in foreign markets and reduces the value of the profits they bring back home to the U.S. Coming back to, excuse me, get back to business news. The exact number of those who signed cards is not released in this next story, but the Machinist Union on Monday asked for an election so about 2,500 Boeing production workers in South Carolina can decide whether they want U.S. Represent, union representation. Excuse me. This from the AP. The aeronautics giant immediately responded that a union is not in the best interest of the company, the workers, or the staff. Spokesman Frank Larkin said that the machinists have petitioned the National Labor Relations Board and that under agency rules, 30 percent of the workers in a potential bargaining unit must sign cards that they want to vote. Company spokeswoman Candy Eslinger said the petition to the NLRB includes production and maintenance workers as the assembly plant and the nearby Interior's Responsibility Center, which provides interior parts for the 787. Larkin says he expects that about 2,500 workers will be eligible to vote. Four years ago, shortly before the company opened the $750 million facility, the NLRB filed a complaint against Boeing, alleging that the non-union plant was built in retaliation against Washington state workers who went on strike. The NLRB dropped the complaint later after Boeing agreed that the 737 MAX would be built in Washington. Beverly Wise, the VP and general manager for Boeing South Carolina, said in a statement that South Carolina workers did what many said could not be done in opening the plant. She said the union originally opposed the plant, and now the same union that tried to take our jobs, quote, and our work has already begun to divide our team. But Larkin says it's important to the workers to be heard. The union has had members in the Charleston area before. It won the right to represent workers at Vought Aircraft Industries in 07, a plant that Boeing later bought. Less than two years later, plant workers decided they didn't want a union. So it's going to be interesting to see where the vote goes from here. Stay with us. We will bring you the results of that vote if it comes to fruition. And one from Bloomberg News, McDonald's fries are cooked throughout the day in a mix of veggie oils heated to more than 335 degrees Fahrenheit. The hamburger grill is covered in hot grease. The cookie ovens get pretty hot, too. No wonder getting burned is the most common in injury in the fast food industry. 79% of workers were burned in the past year, most more than once, according to a fast food workplace survey released today by Heart Research Associates. Now, 28 McDonald's workers who say they were burned on the job have filed complaints with OSHA. The employees who work in 19 cities are supported by the Fight for $15 campaign, which disclosed some of their statements and photos of burns the size of hash brown. The chain is already struggling to fix pretty much everything about it operates, from its menu to its service to its image. The protesters and activists have recently helped publicize a racial discrimination suit against the company and allegations of tax avoidance in Europe. McDonald's has said that it doesn't discriminate and that it pays all taxes. The burn complaints opened a new front in the battle for higher wages, more corporate accountability, and unionization, Jay. So I'm sure that you're thinking that McDonald's is pretty much mcscrewing themselves by not handling these complaints before they came to our attention mm, that's why they're known to me as mccrappers because they don't <laughs> get the crap done get the crap done right but at the same time 
unless the burns are actually serious, you just bandage them up and move on. I mean, I've worked with fast food before. I mean, Jay, you know me. I've worked in a grocery deli, and I've sometimes come home with burns that look like Mount Fuji. But I'm still alive, so they didn't do much below the surface. Corey Evan with the business news. Thank you very much. And as Corey goes, take, goes and takes care of his Mount St. Helens of bruises, um, I'll go <laughs> take the D.C. news at this particular point. Thank you for that, Corey. will be back a couple of minutes with tonight's lawsuits across America in the entertainment report. Now to D.C. news. Top officials in the Obama administration have consulted former CIA director and general David Petraeus about the fight against the Islamic State group, also known as Danish, to this broadcast, despite his admission that he gave classified material to his biographer and mistress, according to the White House. Sp speaking today, Petra Petraeus was brought in by President George W. Bush to command multinational forces in Iraq in 2007 and preside over the surge of American forces there. Defending the Obama administration's decision to get advice from him peri periodically, White House spokesman and BS artist Josh Erdes said Petraeus maintains a strong relationship with the Iraqi military and political leaders. He, uh, Ernest continued to BS and say, quote, He is, I think, legitimately regarded as an expert when it comes to the se uh, security situation in Iraq. So I think it makes a lot of sense for senior administration officials to, on occasion, consult him for advice. Petraeus has had only a handful of conversations with officials in the White House's National Security Council since last summer, said a White House official who said it was similar to the consultation the White House conducts with a variety of national security experts. Petraeus is not advising the White House in any official capacity, is not getting paid for his advice, said the official, was not authorized to discuss the arrangement by name, and requested anonymity. Of course he is. A retired four-star general, Petraeus' vaunted career suffered a major blow from revelations he gave the biographer Paula Broadwell eight binders of classified material he had improperly kept. The 62-year-old agreed earlier this month to plead guilty to a misdemeanor count that carries a possible sentence of up to a year in prison. Ernest said he wasn't aware of any security precautions taken due to Petraeus' legal situation at this time. Federal agencies made $125 billion in improper payments last year, including tax credits to people who didn't qualify, uh, Medicare payments for treatments that might not be necessary, and unemployment benefits for people who are actually working, said a new government report released today. The level of improper payments was a new high after several decades of declines. In addition to fraud, the errors included overpayments and underpayments as well as payments made without proper documentation. While the errors were spread out among 22 federal agencies, three programs stood out, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Earned Income Tax Credit. Together, the three programs accounted for more than $93 billion in improper payments, according to the report by the Government Accountability Office, the investigative arm of Congress. According to uh, Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, who is the chairman of the Senate Committee on Homeland Secur Security and Government Affairs, he said, quote, This taxpayer money was not spent securing our borders. It was not spent on national defense, and it was not spent contributing to a safety net for those in need. This is a problem that is going to get worse year after year if we do not get a handle on it now. Johnson's committee held a hearing Monday on reducing improper payments by improving death records maintained by the Social Security Administration. Social Security has no death record for 6.5 million people who would be at least 112 years old, according to a report by the agency's Inspector General. In reality, only a few possibly uh, be alive. As of the last fall, there were only 42 people known to be that old in the entire world. Interesting statistic there. Only 13 of the people are still getting Social Security benefits, the report said, but for others, their Social Security numbers are still active, so a number could be used to report wages, open bank accounts, obtain credit cards, or claim fraudulent tax refunds. Or, Corey Evan, as we talk about a lot on this program, voter fraud. Oh, yeah, you know all that. It's been coming to a head, and... I think it's going to come to an even bigger head in 2016. Mm, sir, 
certainly right, Corey. Certainly right. All right. Moving on tonight, the U.S. House of Representatives is moving toward a vote in mid-May on the annual half-a-billion-dollar defense policy bill, said U.S. Representative Mac Thorberry, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee today. Thorburn also said, uh, Thornberry, excuse me, uh, said he plans to introduce next week legislation to reform the U.S. defense acquisition process. There is no schedule yet for a vote on that bill in the House, he told a news briefing today saying he first wanted to open up the process for comments. The Defense Policy Bill, which is also known as the N National Defense Authorization Act, will be reviewed in subcommittees during the week of April the 20th and by the full Armed Services Committee during the week of April 27th. It would come before the full House around May 13th, according to a te Texas, the Texas Republican. Considered a must-pass piece of legislation, the Defense Authorization Bill authorizes spending levels for the Pentagon, but also addresses a range of policy matters such as the annual ban on any spending to transfer prisoners to U.S. prisons from the U.S. Detention Center at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. This year's bill might include lethal military aid for the Ukrainian's government as it faces separatist back by Russia, Thorne Berry said. Both Republicans and Democrats in Congress strongly back providing such aid to the Kiev government and members have expressed frustration with President Obama's government for failing to do so. Thornberry has offered few details on his acquisition reform bill beyond saying that it would cut back on regulations. All right, folks, and that's the DC news. We have a few more DC stories we didn't get to tonight, so check out facebook.com forward slash the Evan Miller report for the rest of the news that happened in D.C. today. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for tonight's Lawsuits Across America. And now it's time for Lawsuits Across America. The cases are real. All rise for the Honorable Corey Evans. Thank you as always, Jay uh, and Pat. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated and come to order. Lawsuits Across America is now in session. A trial is set to begin for Mount Morris's, a Mount Morris woman's lawsuit that claims she nearly died when she was given the wrong type of blood while at an area hospital in Flint, Michigan. Jessica Stevens, according to Michigan Live, filed the suit in September 2013 against McLaren Flint, Flint after she claims a mix-up at the hospital left her fighting for her life. The trial is scheduled to begin on March 17th, St. Patty's Day, in front of Genesee Circuit Judge Jeffrey Neathercutt. Stevens claims she went to the hospital's ER June 23, 2011 to have blood drawn for lab tests, but the lawsuit claims the hospital medical technician mishandled another patient's blood and mixed it up with Stevens. The suit alleges the mix-up caused the hospital to determine Stevens' blood type as A positive when she's in fact O positive. Oh dear. She was airlifted to Henry Ford Hospital and remained there for three weeks. So you can tell that this six to seven day trial is going to be one of the most closely watched here at the Evan Miller Report. And the city of Palm Springs, California, will take another seven weeks to settle a lawsuit from the local police union over the public ID of officers who fire their weapons in the line of duty. According to the Desert Sun, during a brief court hearing on Monday morning, attorneys said they were actively negotiating a settlement but needed more time to finalize the details. The lawsuit will return to court on May 4th. The lawsuit began last July when the police union asked a Riverside County judge to block the release of officers' identities. At that time, the Desert Sun had filed a public re records request for the names of police officers who had fired their weapons in recent years. The union responded by taking the news organization and the city to court. The Sun has since been removed from the suit, but the dispute with the city continues. And since it's just right on the other side of Mount San Jacinto... I'm sure I'll hear everything that echoes forth from that lawsuit, and I'll bring it to you in a future report. Till then, I'm Corey Evans saying this has been Lawsuits Across America, case dismissed, and bring in the Red Lobster. I'm kidding. Yes, good idea. Let's get right into entertainment. And it's not such a humorous day on entertainment, I'm afraid. For over two decades, bassist Mike Porcaro was a rock star with the band Toto, playing venues around the world. Now, the music world is mourning the death of Porcaro, who died after a battle with Lou Gehrig's disease, a.k.a. 
amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. He was 59. About 10 years ago, Porcaro started noticing weakness in his fingers and hands. He was diagnosed with the disease in 2006. Former members of his band, known for hits such as Africa and Rosanna, rallied to help. They reunited for a brief European tour in 2010 to support Porcaro. Toto vocalist and guitarist Steve Lukather also called Porcaro a brother. So rest in peace, Mr. Porcaro. With apologies to everyone who had had, had their hopes up that the show's upcoming radical reinvention would lure her back, Jessica Lange is really and truly done with American Horror Story. During the show's annual appearance at Pally Fest, the actress once again confirmed that she's through with Bruce. She, she had, quote, said, quote, we had a great run. But when an Oscar-winning actress's door closes, Ryan Murphy opens a hunky window. Or something like that. That's what Vanity Fair phrases is that it has. At the same panel, both Matt Bomer and Cheyenne Jackson confirmed that they'll be joining the cast for the up- upcoming American Horror Story Hotel, which might be a musical. That would be perfect for both Bomer and Jackson, who made guest appearances on Murphy's Glee and who w- have well-documented signing and singing and dancing skills. Excuse me. Bomer will be the show's male lead and joke that he can't confirm or deny an on-screen romantic relationship with Lady Gaga. And Walt Disney's Cinderella enjoyed one of the biggest debuts of the year last weekend, but its opening numbers were smaller than initial estimates had suggested. They estimated it would be around 70 million, but it came close but no banana with 67.9 million. Still a pretty good number for a live-action remake of an animated classic. That will fall short of Maleficent's 69.4 million debut, although with a budget of 95 million, Cinderella costs half as much as the Sleeping Beauty spin-off. The film picked up 25, 23 mil on Friday, 27.1 mil on Saturday, and 17.8 mil on Sunday, according to Disney. Otherwise, at the box office, Run All Night was second place with just 11 million. Very paltry number, but it's still second place. And Kingsman, The Secret Service, clinging on to third place at 6.2 million. Right, that's your entertainment report. And before I send it back to Jay, I just have to point out that over at Dairy Queen, if you have a Dairy Queen near your home, head on over today because they're giving away free ice cream today. Yes, you heard me right. Yes. Nothing like a nice ice cream cone in the hot Southern California weather because summer decided to come early here. So if you're here if here in the state of California, or is this across the United States? We weren't exactly I believe this is across their network of restaurants, but confirm that with the Dairy Queen nearest your home. You'll probably see a line at the door. But it's not just so you can get a free ice cream. They're also giving you the opportunity to donate to the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And as you know, that's to help raise money to improve the lives of terminally ill children. So head on out and make a donation if you can make it happen. Absolutely. Sounds like a good plan there. All right, folks, before we leave you, just a reminder of our main headlines tonight. A Chechnyan woman has kidnapped her Dutch children to join the Danish terrorist terrorist group. Iraqi intelligence has revealed that a Baghdad car bomber's tricks today after arresting up to 31 today. And the Afghan army has killed the commander of a a Danish affiliate over in Afghanistan. Stay with the Evan Miller Report on all these stories and more every day, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, and check out our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash The Evan Miller Report. All right, folks, that does it for us tonight here on The Evan Miller Report. Up next is the National Weather Forecast with the BBC Met Office's Phil, A- uh, Phil Avery. After that, the Exceptional Conservative Show. For, I'm Jason Miller. For Corey Evan and all of us here at the Evan Miller Report, we wish you a great night. Good night, everybody. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network.
Hello once again. Time we brought you right up to date with how we see things panning out across both Canada and the USA in the next couple of days or so. Looks quite busy, doesn't it? And indeed it is to some degree. We've had one storm gradually pulling away from the eastern seaboard of Canada, the northeast of the USA. That brought quite a bit of rainfall in. Uh, another little system for Tuesday will just bring a further bout of rain or snow, just depending on location there. More likely to be snow for the New Brunswick area, but come a little bit further south into the northeast of the USA. Some wet weather, and then it turns a wee bit cooler, to say the very least, because we're going to import some colder air out of the heart of Canada, shovel it ever further towards the southeast. And all the while, on the western side of Canada, well, it just depends. The further south you come, I think there's a greater chance of just seeing uh, some rain or snow showers. But further south, again, the story here across the southwestern quarter of the USA is one of heat. Out towards the east, temperatures are set to fall as we start to bring in the cold air as this feature moves away. Uh, so we'll get on the northern side, i.e. the cold side of a cold front, doing what it says on the tin, introducing much colder air uh, down across that northeastern quarter. Uh, and there you begin to see those temperatures having been at around about 9 or 10 at the start of the week, falling back to around 2. Uh, the conversion's there for you in Fahrenheit. Short-lived, short, sharp shock, but it's there to be had all the same. And eventually the rain returns to Vancouver by Thursday. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network.